there was ranking in my high school, so you did know what number you were. And it, it weighs on you. The list would be posted and it's used as incentive. You can go up in the list if you work harder, but sometimes that isn't the reality. And no matter how hard you work, that number might not change. And it makes you feel like, well, what am I working so hard for? It was a musical about students and it was a musical about the intense pressure that students feel to get into college and some of the inaccessibilities in that and how it's not completely equal opportunity and how much mental, emotional, physical stress that that puts on different types of people. And we were told it was very inspired by our own experiences. We went into this really thinking we we're going to tell the story of the families and the moral choices that they made about trying to get their kids into the same handful of highly competitive schools and sort of beg the question of parents who want the best for their kids often do the worst thing possible for their children. Dear Family is a podcast hosted by Rachel Steinman, a writer, an educator, and a mental health advocate. And Rachel gets us up close and personal, so we feel a strong connection, familiarity, and comfort with her guests. So settle in and join us as we search for true healing and journey with Rachel and her most interesting guests. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Dear Family, the podcast. I hope that you are well. And by that, I mean, I hope your mental health is well and that it is at the top of your priority list, which means you're putting yourself at the top of the priority list. Today, we are going to talk about a high school musical and not the one that you're thinking of, not a Disney Channel fantasy. This is more one that is steeped in our reality and a reality that is about the current mental stresses and challenges that our teenagers and young adults are facing when it comes to academic and social and economic pressures. And really, this is about the high cost of college, both literally and figuratively. And when we discuss our kids' mental health, we are talking about that figurative idea of the cost of how much pressure getting into college is, affording college, and being ranked, and all of those things that go with it. And we're going to explore and discuss the question of what is real success? What does it look like? And how can we best support our amazing kids and young adults so that they no longer feel like just a number and they don't feel like they have to be ranked or where they fall on a scale matters, whether they're above or below average. We want them to have an authentic experience in this big, beautiful life. And we want them to feel like there are open horizons. I love this conversation. Please share it with a loved one, someone who may be in college or high school or thinking about college. I really think it's going to open up a lot of important conversations. And I know you're not going to want to miss this. So thank you for listening. And also thank you so much for subscribing to the Dear Family podcast and following me on all the social media platforms. That's right now, Rachel, right with a W. And if you'd be so kind and write a five-star review for the podcast, that's fantastic. And that goes a long way in getting the word out and spreading that message that we want to replace the shame and the stigma when it comes to mental health and family secrets and replace it with love and compassion. On that note, enjoy this new episode. My so-called high school rank premiering on HBO and HBO Max is a special documentary that gives an unfiltered view into the private loneliness and the pressures of teenage life. This was especially true in March, 2020, when students were forced to settle into new realities and they were feeling isolated and frustrated with so much out of their control. This timely documentary chronicles the creation of a musical theater production at Granite Bay High School in Sacramento, California, and it's inspired by students' stories of the constant pressures to achieve a top rank in every part of their lives to get ahead in today's fierce college admissions process. In an uncanny case of art anticipating real life, Granite Bay's musical Ranked 
was in the works weeks before Rick Singer and the Varsity Blues scandal made headlines in 2019. The play's apt timing and subject matter speak to a culture where many students feel driven to succeed at any cost. As news emerged of the production of a musical exploring these critical issues, other schools reached out to stage their own productions because high schoolers around the country could connect with the show's themes as they themselves were struggling to find their own place in this world amid intense college admissions competition. The film chronicles auditions and rehearsals at three high schools, from Ripley, West Virginia, to Cupertino, California, to the Bronx, New York where students face similar challenges despite dramatically different life circumstances. It also charts the success of the musical and the first steps towards the realization of the creator's dream to mount the show on Broadway, only to be sidelined by the global shutdown. Shot over two years in public schools representing vastly different communities, my so-called high school rank reveals the remarkable resilience and similarities that bind this generation across economic and racial divides. The award-winning producers and directors Ricky Stern and Annie Sundberg's films and series have been shortlisted for the Oscars and earned multiple Emmy and Peabody nominations, among other honors. They are joined by the two fabulous and inspirational students that are featured in the documentary. Anvita Gatani, who played the original role of Jordan and ranked at Granite Bay High School, is currently studying at NYU Tisch. And Nahaley Urbez Cruz is a former student at Fordham High School for the Arts and is currently at Cornell University. You are not going to want to miss this important conversation. Welcome. I'm so thrilled to have the documentary filmmakers of my so-called high school rank and two of the phenomenal students that are showcased with us today for the Dear Family podcast. I watched the documentary with great interest. It really feels very timely and moving and important. I found myself getting very teary-eyed. I understand how much pressure our students are in. I volunteer for National Alliance on Mental Illness and go and speak to high schools and middle schools and see what pressures our kids are under. And I also have a daughter that just went through the college application process through the pandemic. She's now a sophomore. And they have a daughter that is 11th grade who's at a performing arts school. And she really cares about academics and is going through this process of applications right now. So much of high school has turned into getting into college. I love that this is from the standpoint of a musical production, and it really takes us on quite a roller coaster. And a big portion of what this does boil down to is the high cost of college and whether it's worth it. And especially as an artist and entering with debt and We see so much stress put on our students. We're going to get to that later. I'm really thrilled to have this conversation with you all. Because this is a podcast called Dear Family, and we like to talk about how mental health affects the entire family, I always love to begin by having my guests introduce themselves. Tell us a little bit about where you grew up and a little bit about yourself. And we'll start with Annie. Well, I grew up in Edina, Minnesota, which is a suburb of Minneapolis. I'm the fourth of a family of four kids. I went to a high school that was pretty driven, pretty small. I ended up going to college where I ended up meeting Ricky and that landed me on the East Coast. And I always knew I wanted to work in film in some way. And so I've been in New York ever since college graduation. That's my story in a nutshell. Great. Ricky. I grew up in New York City. I went to a small all girls school and I did a lot of theater. And then I went to Dartmouth where I met Annie. Actually, we met on a feature film in Northern Vermont. And I was always interested in theater. I have an older brother who went to Hollywood and became a producer. And somehow it got more for me into documentaries. And after college, pretty much started working in the documentary world. I, I have three kids, two of whom have graduated college. So I've been to, through that process twice and one who's a senior right now. And so I'm going through it with him right now. And I've learned a lot. I do feel like making this film has helped. And I think living through the pandemic has helped put perspective, at least in my family, like how you live your lives. 
Ayali. I grew up in the Dominican Republic. I was born and raised there. I moved to the Bronx when I was about 10 years old, almost 11, with my mom. I went to a public school in the Bronx called Fordham High School for the Arts. We see in the documentary. I was a dance major and now I'm in Cornell University as a sophomore studying sociology and information science. Amazing. Congrats. Thank you. Anvita. Hi, I'm Anvita. I grew up in Sacramento, California. My parents are both immigrants from India, so they moved. And that's where my little brother and I grew up. We grew up going to public schools in the area and then Granite Bay High School, which is also featured in the documentary. And it was honestly in high school that I started falling in love with the arts and for the first time even considered that, oh my God, someone like me could pursue something like this. I didn't even know that there was an option to do anything like that. And that landed me here in New York where I'm studying at Tisch. And I'm a drama major, an actor, director, and I still sing. Yeah, very grateful. I love that the arts don't have to be one direction. They can take you down all different kinds of roads. Annie and Ricky, your documentary began as a way of capturing the making of Ranked, which is a high school musical about the pressures students feel about being ranked. But you ended up showing us just how true to life the stage production really was. Can you tell us why art anticipated real life? In some ways, I feel like that's a question for Amita because she was right in the ground zero of it all. I'll be really honest. We went into this really thinking we we're going to tell the story of the families and the moral choices that they made about trying to get their kids into the same handful of highly competitive schools and sort of beg the question of parents who want the best for their kids often do the worst thing possible for their children along the way. And how do you repair a family relationship when someone does something so horribly wrong. And we ended up not being able to get anybody to sign on to talk on camera. And so we quickly pivoted. And that's why I think when we first heard about this musical and started to understand the lyrics, it was such an of the moment experience. We really were guided by the musical in large part for lots of reasons in the making of this film. Amvita, do you want to? Yeah, this is so interesting. It was the end of my junior year. And we have this fun little showcase that we do in the spring just for each other. It's like miscast. So everybody plays a role that they shouldn't play. And at the end of it, the seniors came out and we're like, we're performing something. And everyone was like, what's happening now? And David starts playing something on the piano and all of our seniors start singing. And, uh, we all just sat there and are like, what are the seniors singing? Like no one practices. We don't know about this. And then that night we were all crying and David and Holmes were like, we're writing a musical and you guys are going to do it next year. The seniors sent it off for us. And what we were told was it was a musical about students and it was a musical about the intense pressure that students feel to get into college and some of the inaccessibilities in that and how it's not completely equal opportunity and how much mental, emotional, physical stress that that puts on different types of people. And we were told it was very inspired by our own experiences. So then we would like just sit and they would ask us, you're applying for college right now. How's that been? Or they'd be like, hey, that situation happened while you were still in high school. Do you want to talk about it? And a lot of people like freshmen through seniors, we just sat in a room and talked about our own experiences within the school system. Like, do I have a future in the school system? Do I want a future in the school system? And David and uh, Holmes talk about how this idea of buying grades and buying ranks was really a lot of adults in their own lives were like, well, that's really out there for your musical. But I think when they told us, we were like, nope, yeah, pretty much. Like all of us were pretty unfazed by how dark some of it was and how deep some of the mental health struggles were because they were also inspired by a lot of our own experiences. So then when the college admission scandal happened, we had just been having a conversation about it happening for months and months and months. And we'd been discussing the kind of pressure, anxiety, and strain on relationships this chase causes. So it was surprising, but it wasn't surprising at all. It made sense that it was happening. If you sit and actually see what people are going through, it makes sense that it'll push some people to do really outlandish things. 
which is why I understand so many schools want to put on the production because kids can really relate. We know that our youth are becoming increasingly more anxious, more depressed, and a lot of it has to do with this pressure put on them for getting into college. And also the concerns of being able to afford it because it just continues to get so expensive. One student in the documentary articulated it really well when they said that they feel pressured not to feel like a failure. And I'm going to quote some of the lyrics. We are stressed. We are overwhelmed. We are drowning. And we don't feel like anyone is going to save us anytime soon. You both went to high schools where I'm sure this really resonated. Can you? articulate why were you so stressed in high school? What were those pressures? I definitely can resonate with the lyrics because I remember in high school being such a perfectionist. And I can't tell you where it stemmed from because at least for my personal experience, my mom has been a very easygoing kind of mom. She kind of just trusted me to do what I had to. I would say it's normalized pressure in school systems to perform almost at a like perfect level of 4.0. I look back at it and I'm like, oh, I put in a lot of work and it was very stressful. I would get one point off on an exam and it would ruin my entire day or I would let the numbers really get to me. I'm not sure if it's still currently there, but there was ranking in my high school. So you did know what number you were and it, it in a ways on you. The list would be posted and it's used as incentive. Like, well, you can go up in the list if you work harder, but sometimes that isn't the reality. And no matter how hard you work, that number might not change. And it makes you feel like, well, what am I working so hard for? Also it takes away from what really matters in high school, which is like socializing and making friends and making experiences. And that can all get clouded by your academic responsibilities, which obviously should be your priority. But I think it's so normalized now for that to be year one focus in high school. And now everybody's just kind of in this trance where it's like, it's normal to have your academics be everything you worry about. And I think even when I talk to my friends about the documentary now, they're like, well, well, yeah, like that's the college system. That's high school. I guess they don't see it as a big thing. I think a lot of people my age don't really realize that things weren't always like this. This is something that's been happening now. And it's something that's taking up a big part of our lives now. Students just go through with it and keep it in and go through the motions because it's what we're expected to do. When I went to high school, there was not a ranking system. That just feels like a pressure cooker. And you're adding AP scores, SAT scores, ACT scores, college choice rankings, social media likes and views, and all of these numbers to define who you are, of course, that's going to feel really bad. And I like how the documentary talked about how our students are in this constant state of, am I above average? Am I below average? Where do I fall? This question is for anyone. If you were talking to a younger sibling or to a freshman coming in, what advice would you give them? How do you redefine success so you're not just looking at that number? That's a question. Annie and I get asked all the time, you know, so what's the solution? What's the fix? Who's yes. the Teachers often say it's the parents. The parents are putting the pressure on the students. Parents say it's the schools. The schools have these rankings. The schools will sometimes say it's the universities, it's the colleges, because it's so competitive now and the, the students have to get the A's and have to get the 1600s on the SATs or they don't stand out. I'm curious to hear what everyone else has to say, but I do think it's a multi-leveled, layered kind of issue. I love what Oja says in the opening of the film, which is like, here's the thinking. I get good grades. I get into a good college. I get a good job. I have a happy life. There is this economic pressure for jobs and fulfillment and what that definition of success has come to mean. And then you have someone like Evan in West Virginia who says... I want to get a business degree. I could be out $100,000 in debt or more if I go to college that's not my state school, or I can go to my state school, probably get a similar education, if not the same, 
and then be out the door and doing what I want to do. It's that kind of thinking as well. What are our state schools? How in the United States are our schools so expensive, the private schools, the cost, the lack of support financial loans, as we've just seen in this administration, I think is part of it too. So it's a very layered issue. I will say coming into the Ivy League school system, that's the mindset you will encounter. You go to school, you get good grades, you go to an Ivy League school, and then you get a really good job because you went to an Ivy League school and then you're set. Even if you speak to students who are freshmen here, you'll see that their goals are like, I'm going to get this job and I'm going to be rich and I'm going to have all these connections. And not saying that those are their only goals, but definitely the main one. And it's because we've had these systems in place for a really long time. We've seen them grow more complex and the requirements grow more intense and harsher and the expectations of what makes an Ivy League student or a good student in general have gone from you do well in your classes and that makes you a good student to, well, now you need to do well in your classes, have extracurriculars, you need to be active member in clubs, you need to show leadership, you need to show community engagement, you need to have a job, you need to still be social and be able to communicate yourself well. And the list of requirements just keeps getting longer and longer. And you'll see that students are fully capable of fulfilling them, but it's extremely taxing, extremely draining on the psyche. I can personally say I am running around all the time in Cornell. And I remember in high school as well, I was just running around trying to do as much as I can and fit as much as I can into my day because it would look good for college applications and because it's what I'm supposed to do. And it goes to the question of what is success. And I've been asking myself that even now. And after watching the documentary, it brought it all back for me. And I'm like, wow, like, what is success? Because you really start to look back and think, like, was all of this worth it? Am I content that all of this time was put into this? Did this give me fulfillment? Am I happy? And I think that's where success should be focused. I think it should be focused on how you're feeling. I remember like the first time I did a musical um, and it's kind of how I got into theater because again, I was a dance major. I didn't do theater. I I did Newsies and it was at a Fordham Preparatory, which is right across from our school. And I would be so happy, like smiling ear to ear every time I went to rehearsal and I performed and and it it was so euphoric and I was content and proud. And I can always look back at that moment and feel those feelings. And I think that that's how everybody should feel about the things that they're working towards academic wise and career wise. I think people and students should be encouraged to pursue what makes them happy. And that would make uh, these crazy requirements maybe a little more worth it. Right now, students are pushed towards things that they maybe don't love uh, because it's what we think of as successful for money reasons or whatever. It's obviously not as simple as doing what you love, but if there was more emphasis placed on the actual happiness of the individual and what the individual feels good doing, we would learn a lot and we would see that a lot of students are doing things they don't want to, are doing things that they feel they have to do to accommodate or fit into this mold that now students feel they need to fit to be successful. Just taking that shift would probably help a lot of people I know out, would definitely help me. I like that you brought the word contentment up. I'm a big believer in putting your mental health first. I've seen too many people that quote unquote, have it all, the big house, successful career, and they're so unhappy. So what kind of success is that? And I love that you brought up that when you did Newsies, you had that moment of like, this is what makes me feel content and happy. This feeling is what I want to hold on to. I don't know if it's the universities. I don't know if it's the high schools or the parents or students in general, but we need to put our mental health first, make it a priority because our kids are breaking down. We're social creatures as humans and the pandemic really isolated us. And yet our kids were still trying to figure out their identity and who they were without 
having that support system. We know that things like theater and school clubs, whether you want to call it a passion project or whatever you want to call it, is so good for the psyche, our mental health. Now, thoughts of self-harm and suicide increased even further from the pandemic, adding more pressure to our kids. Why is creativity such an amazing outlet and antidote to the stress that our kids are under. The creativity that's expressed both in the making of a documentary and also in the work that these kids did with the musical and the theater work, that's about community. I think there are creative endeavors that are fairly solo. You could be a novelist, you could be a painter, but there's something about doing something in community that involves creative stretching that really felt emotionally helpful and motivating during a time when we were also isolated. And I think sometimes it's just that you have to show up for someone else that when you're not feeling at your best or you're feeling exhausted, you're feeling anxious, just to have to show up for someone else. And in an environment that is for the most part accepting, Arcadia Conrad, who is the Cupertino drama teacher, she talks about how if you put kids in a room and just allow them to be and to respond to things, to be fully present and to not feel judgment in that moment, there's something incredibly powerful about that. I think creativity and storytelling is such a commitment to the art of being present and being curious. And often classrooms and numbers and binaries of above or below don't really allow space for curiosity and space for discovery. And that in itself is literally presence because you're fighting towards something in the future. You're not worrying or being present with who you are and how you are and how the people around you are. Something that I love about what I do is it it really feels like I dedicate my whole studies to becoming a better person because I have to be present to be an artist and I have to be connected to myself and connected to other people. We were talking about success and and what is measuring success. And I think something that people so often forget about success is uh, why is success not sustainability? Why is it a metric? And I think art is so empowering because you can define everything with metrics. You can define art with metrics. You can define storytelling with metrics. This whole documentary could be defined by the amount of viewers that see it and how much money it makes. That is one way to do it, but also to get the right interviews from people, to be able to connect people with the words you're singing. It requires you to not just worry about doing, but worry about being. That means forming impactful relationships and community, not just meeting metrics. And that's how art becomes impactful. It's almost the study of just being, not performing. And I'm obsessed with it. Can I take that one step further to what you're saying? Because I once did a, a talk at our college about art It used to be very, and I think it probably still is, compartmentalized. Oh, art, that's where we're going to go on Friday night and watch the theater performance or go see the movie or go hear a band. And I really feel very strongly, especially what everyone is saying here, is that art is in our daily lives, no matter what you do. If you're a mathematician, that can be a very creative thing you're doing. And you can apply your, whatever art is, that ability to connect, that ability to think outside the box, that desire to be collaborative, to be in the moment, all those things that I think we experience in art and self-expression and being unguarded and, and just throwing stuff on the wall. We can apply that in any part of our lives, even as we parent. If you're going into social work, whatever it is, or psychiatry, I just encourage us to think about art as something that we all are a part of. And we saw that during the pandemic, art brought us together, not just in a way that was theater and music, but just this need to be collaborative, this need to be in the same room, even if it's on Zoom, the need to talk and share and listen. Speaking from personal experience, when we were filming Ranked, we were doing it like half virtually, which was really interesting because theater is not supposed to happen through a screen. It wasn't made for that. But I think... I can honestly say if I hadn't been a part of this musical, 
I probably would have been completely isolated because it was at a point where I was a senior, completely burnt out at that point. I didn't have to have my camera on, so most of the students never did. Social interaction was very minimal, and I had to be present because I had made a commitment to Miss Key, and I had made a commitment with all my peers. So that's what got me there. And I wasn't always the best because everybody was going through their own things too. But it was that community and it was that commitment to my community that pushed us to keep doing it and pushed us to keep showing up every day and kept us there, kept us present. I think me and Joe Lamar had just many conversations about like, oh, I'm so tired. I just want to sleep. But even though we said this and even though we would say like every single time, we'd still show up (laughs) and we would still go in there and try our best to make the best out of a really unfortunate bittersweet situation I would say that sense of community is what got us up every day and got us active and it was one of the only times I would see my friends and laugh with them which is kind of sad to think about but it really kept us together for sure we had never been through a pandemic so it just shows how powerful art is in that sense and the fact that it prevailed even in such a dark time and time where all the odds were against theater and all the odds were against creativity and arts. Bringing up the community aspect is so important. And another thing you're all doing is storytelling. And the power in storytelling is that it helps you connect to others and find compassion for others. And I think that that is an immensely important to see one, oh, I'm not the only one feeling this, or, oh, I didn't see it that way, or, oh, look at different perspectives. That's why I'm a huge believer in arts education to lift up communities and also just for joy. You showed students from various high schools, from Cupertino, which is made up of Silicon Valley's elite. And we saw their parents, many of them emigrated from different countries like Japan, India, Russia, Mexico, et cetera. And they really wanted to push their kids to succeed. One of the points that I found really poignant was that these are kids whose all their parents want to push them to succeed. And they're in one group and there can only be one top student. Talk about boiling pressure point. That's just unbelievable. And I see that because my daughter went to a very college prep oriented all girls school in LA. And I was similar to Nahaley's mom go have fun. And she, and all the pressure actually came from her. So whether it's coming from the students or the parents, it's there. And then you took us to West Virginia where they have different pressures, but are regardless kids, they're in this high school environment where their futures are unknown. And I'm wondering, Annie and Ricky, if you could tell us what all the students had in common regardless of what high school you went to. The one thing I would say is that each kid was pushing for a different top. The Cupertinos were going for the same kinds of top tier, academically rigorous colleges. The kids in West Virginia were all going for a GPA that would qualify for the large part for what are called promise grants out of West Virginia education fund that would allow them to afford whatever post-secondary thing they wanted to go for. And then obviously you guys can speak to what you experienced in New York. But I think the one thing that was also interesting is We were self-selected. We were in theater communities. We were not with the athletes. We were not with the kids who were going for sports scholarships. We were also not with the true STEM kids who were really heading off into engineering programs. But I think was clear was that he went to engineering. That's true. That's true. But for the, I mean, but at least the kids that we focused on were part of a musical. They had all come into a theater experience. And so they, that was something that they were making a choice to give time to in their high school experience whatever they might have to give up to make room for an art experience was important to them. And I think that was the universal link that all of these kids chose to give time to that, despite everything else that they were carrying. I would just say the other thing that I think struck us all is whether it was the student in Cupertino who works at a Starbucks, who says, I just don't want to punch the clock every day and sit at a desk, or whether it's Annie Blizzard in West Virginia who said, I just want to do something like special effects. There's no art schools in my town in Ripley, West Virginia, or whether it's students in the Bronx or in Brooklyn who we were filming with, 
who are also striving for something. I think that's what was so inspiring for all of us is that it didn't matter where these students were coming from, what their socioeconomic background, what even their parents' background was. There was that youthful, aspirational, inspirational motivation to do something with their life that would bring them joy, that they were holding on to, even with the pressures and even having to get into the right schools or the right scholarships, they still aspired to do something that would bring them joy. That was the part that I think struck us all like, wow, there is still hope no matter what your background is, that you'll find that thing that you can do, that you can earn your living, but you can also be happy with. That's what we want for our kids, of course. Ranked has been licensed to more than 75 schools. And of course, I'm not surprised, and I'm sure that number will grow. What conversations are you hoping this documentary and the musicals in high schools push people to have? I really hope it shows the people I am friends with and the people that I know that are still in my high school aspiring for the same things I was. I hope it just shows them like, maybe this all isn't okay. And maybe you should be focusing on yourself a little more. And maybe, just maybe, you aren't defined by a number and you can't be ever because you are a human being with a soul and an experience. And I think, unfortunately, what we see in the documentary is extremely normalized. I think a lot of students just think these are the way things are. When they said it was almost a dystopian musical, I found it a little funny because I'm like, well, it's our reality that nobody really questions as much as they should. We need to start working towards prioritizing our mental health and prioritizing the things that we love to do. Just prioritizing the general well-being of students and individuals rather than how well they can perform and how well they can do a task. Because I think that often that's what we're measured by, at least here in college. It's like, well, how well can you do a project? How well can you test? How well can you write an essay? Well, since you keep getting access and you keep having to perform in these tasks, you keep thinking, well, these are defining things. These are things that define me. I hope it opens conversations and makes people see that these aren't defining factors of character or value. I completely resonate with what you were saying. I definitely want people to know that success is not one size fits all and there isn't one version of success and it can't be one size fits all because we're not the same. We're different and we have different backgrounds and cultures and things to bring to the table and passions. So success is definitely not one size fits all. Therefore, one metric of success cannot define us all. For students and parents and administrators to be curious about what kind of thing is success for this person and what feels like success for this person, because we are not all looking for the same things actually innately. And some of us may love the arts. Some of us may want a family. Some of us may want a lot of different things. Something that I also would really, really love for people to resonate with in this documentary. One, this is a large conversation that we had when we were creating the documentary about why, why is the education system not changing at a faster rate? When we see these statistics, something that's really hard about changing the education system is once you get through the education system, so vivid for you when you're in it. Then once you get through it, you're like, ah, I got through it. I'll get through it. And then there isn't this motivation to change it because you've gotten through it and it's not as present. So really thinking about like, no, I got through it, but did it need to be that hard? And are there ways that we can make it better? Not I got through it, so they'll get through it. I think you guys did a beautiful thing by letting students run the show and guiding and facilitating spaces for that. And I want people to look at youth and students as people with real experiences and opinions and values and people that are blossoming into something that can heal themselves and their parents and their families in the world, but really to know your voice and your opinion matters. And age doesn't change that. If you feel something, you feel something and like no one can invalidate that. 
And I think the documentary does a beautiful job of really lifting that up as well. The one thing that I was thinking was kind of remarkable is we got all the kids from the different schools together on Saturday night here in New York City for the screening. It wasn't all of the students we filmed with. It was a handful of people who were able to make it in. But I just think that so often we look at education, not just for the classes that we get, but the access to the world that a specific school or opportunity might bring us closer to. And my hope is that we can all serve as facilitators and mentors and connectors in each other's lives, because then it frees you up from saying, oh, only these schools are going to be the path for me. But what I loved was it was so great to have, it was Jolimar actually, Nayeli, was one of the kids from the Bronx connecting with you, Anvita, about theater experiences, because you're from opposite sides of the country, but now you're both in places where you have direct relevant experience to share with each other, which was so beautiful. If this film also opens that up for people, it could be really great. What I've seen, and we saw it Saturday night with all the students coming together, what I've seen in my own son, who's a senior in his high school class, is that they're supporting each other. I keep asking him, are you feeling the pressure? He said, not for my friends. We don't talk about it. We support each other. And I think what one thing at least his school is doing is encouraging that. Like someone's a backup might be someone's first choice. So we're not going to talk about schools. Stay in your own movie is what his dean suggest. And I'm like, that's perfect. And I think the students, the young people who've lived through this, who have felt the isolation during the pandemic, hopefully coming out of it now can be more supportive with each other. And I think the adults in the room just need to back off. We need to back down and back off and let the students and the kids direct their future. I love that. Stay in your own movie. That is a good one. Typically, I end the podcast by asking two questions. If you could write your younger self a love letter. And because Nayali and Anvita, you probably started high school around 15. So what would you tell your 15-year-old self if you could write a Dear Nayali love letter now that you know where you are? We actually had that assignment as our senior year to write a letter to your younger self. Dear Nayeli, take it easy on yourself. You are fully capable and things will turn out okay. Just really value the time you have with the people that are around you and experience as much as possible. Try not to spend so much time worrying about homework and exams and grades because I assure you, you will do great regardless. Definitely spend more time loving yourself and figuring out who you are as a student. I think I didn't really do that in high school, but it's a time of self-discovery. I was just trying to fulfill what everybody wanted me to be instead of figuring out who I wanted to be. I definitely give myself that time and just meet the requirements that I have of myself, not the requirements that everybody else had of me. That's probably still true for you. Of course. That was what was so beautiful about the documentary. I saw myself and every student, just how much self-discovery we have to do and how we're all just trying to figure out who we are in this world. And there's so many factors that can affect that. Little side note, you continue to try to figure out who you are, even when you get out of college. I'm still trying to figure it out. What about you, Anvita? Yeah, this is such a beautiful assignment. I love it. I would say this to my 13, 14, 15, all the way till my current self. Dear Anvita, focus on being, not doing, because you're enough and you don't need to prove that to yourself, to your parents, to the world, or to anyone around you. And if you focus on being, not just doing, you will discover really incredible things. And you deserve to take that time to do that. And you deserve to slow down and allow yourself to stroll sometimes and just breathe and stroll rather than running. And then I would say one more thing. I would say the audacious amount of love you have for the world and everything in it And that optimism is your superpower. And don't let anyone ever jade you to that by telling you you're naive because it's your superpower and it's special. So impressed that you recognize that in yourself. That's going to take you really far. I might echo something that Anvita said, which is just don't miss your life. Being not doing, I think is really important. And in the moments of deepest anxiety, look to the people who love and support you, figure out where you feel most comfortable in your own skin. 
And that's so much about the being. Now I'm crying because of Anvita and Nayeli. My letter to myself would be to cherish the moments with your friends and your family. Cherish those moments because that's what we remember when you get to be an old person like myself. You remember the stress, but what you really remember are those birthday parties and those walks with your cousin or the phone calls with your friends. Have those dinners, take a pause, be with your family and your friends. And tell people you love them. Yeah, definitely. Last question. What brings you joy? What are some happiness habits you have? Mine, watch streets. So my friends back home. I think Cornell's tough. It's a really different environment. I am all by myself here, just figuring out who I am again and figuring out what matters to me and who do I want to become. I think when you're asking yourself these big questions, it's really easy to get lost in them and get stressed and worried about what's to come. My friends keep me really grounded in that sense. I was kind of drowning again in all the work I had before I went back to the documentary premiere. And I just got to breathe and just talk to my friends. And what did we do? We got tacos right after the premiere in our little dresses and heels. And I felt like I was on top of the world because it was such a genuine and simple moment away from everything. My friends definitely keep me grounded because we're all going through the same things and we understand each other so well. My family, like Ricky said, just keeping the people that love you there and making memories with them. That's been like the most helpful thing for me. Community is a big, big, big thing that brings me happiness and joy and finding community within myself. That was a big, big, big hard thing to learn during the pandemic. Very, very, very difficult. But finding community within myself and the belief in hope for like, maybe I don't have that best friend today, but I can find them tomorrow or an hour from now. Who knows? And just like having enough belief in myself for hope, that could be like the hope of laughter after a cry. And that could be the hope of creating something that just resonates with one person. Just allowing myself to be present and hopeful brings me a lot of joy. And I find a lot of joy in community. Mine is short. Family and friends bring me joy and work. I love work, but really it's family and friends. Blessings. Absolutely. Family and friends and, I don't know, a dog. I mean, same. Mm -hmm. I just want to thank you all so much. This has been such a wonderful conversation. Tell us where we can see this fantastic documentary that everyone needs to watch. November 29th, HBO and HBO Max. It's going to be both streaming and it's going to be on broadcast. Incredible. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. This is Rachel Steinman. For more information or to contact me with any questions, comments, or guest ideas, please check out rightnowrachel.com. That's right with a W. Thank you so much for listening, subscribing, and sharing, dear family. And if you found value in what you've just heard, I would love and so appreciate a great review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Until next time, I wish you love, happiness, and good mental health. 